interesting. I think with any therapy, um, Dr. Lang mentioned about the, the discussion that one should have with their patients regarding advanced directives and transfusion is really no exception to that. And also, um, I hope by the end of this talk, you're going to see that um, less may be more um, for transfusions. So um, I was really also anticipating this to be, which is kind of informal, just a small group of you, but uh, more kind of around the table discussion versus the audio page and all that, but we'll continue. Um, just a couple things. Uh, I wanted to focus on red cell transfusions, mainly because it's the, um, what we have in the literature to support evidence-based uh, management around this. And, um, and to kind of share with you some of the studies that we now have to date, uh, for um, guiding transfusions, and then also to look at some of the worst outcomes, or to look at some of the outcomes that have been um, shown to be associated with red cells, and what I meant, and as I mentioned, that maybe in our um, practice we need to take a step back and look at what um, really is what's happening with the patient, and say, do we really need to transfuse, and maybe transfusing less will be better for our patients. Okay. With any treatment, I think we have to balance um, that risk and benefit. Um, we all know about the risk for um, infectious diseases. Um, we're real fortunate now with the technology that we have that the, the fear of HIV and hepatitis is now um, about one in two million um, for our patients. Um, However, I think that what we really need to be concerned about, as I'll later discuss, is um, what happens when we transfuse these patients. What is the immunomodulatory effect for a red cell? It is a living transplant, if we think about it that way. Those red cells that stay in that bag don't necessarily um, are dormant. Um, they are still active. We got breakdown products, cytokines, um, interleukins that are given to our patients. Um, now, that being said, there is a benefit, and what, when we have um, bleeding or acute hemorrhage or you know, trauma patient, yes, we need blood, and that those patients need to be transfused. And so a lot of what the studies um, have shown or that are, um, have looked at from a transfusion, and also what we try to practice is, what we want to guide you is in really the non-bleeding patient or very um, a patient that may have been, as we'll show study in um, upper GI bleed, is patients who um, may be um, really mild bleeding um, in, in that aspect. So what evidence do we have to guide transfusion therapy? Well, I think we know about, um, maybe some of you in the room don't know about, but um, from my um, uh, long history of being in transfusion medicine, um, the 10 and 30 rule was for us for a long, long time. And you know, it's interesting when I started to talk about um, transfusions to our residents, I started to look up this and say, okay, where did all that come from? Where did, where did we get 10 and 30? Well, it's kind, of, um, it's kind of sad in this day and age of evidence-based medicine, but it really came and it came from a very well-respected institution, Mayo, in that um, John Lundy was a pioneer anesthesiologist, and he looked at um, his patients, very, he reviewed, I should say not his particular patients, but he reviewed 10 years of records from um, patients who were going to surgery. And he looked back and he said, okay, which patients did the best, had the best outcomes in those, um, after surgery? And he, and in looking at um, that data, he said, well, you know, going into surgery with a hemoglobin of 10 or higher, the patients did better. Um, and so he described this in a surgical textbook, and it became the standard for really all transfusions. And it, it evolved out of tradition and not out of really science for us. Um, but fortunately, um, since 1999, um, which I will describe that first trial, the TRIC trial, we have a few randomized control trials now to guide us in transfusion therapy. And I'll go through those four that I listed there, the TRIC, the TRACS, FOCUS, and then the transfusion strategies in uh, upper GI bleed patients. We also have a number of society guidelines that have really advocated looking at um, a, a global aspect for transfusion of red cells and um, saying that it's mainly looking at the clinical picture for the patient, not just uh, looking at a hemoglobin level or hematocrit level, and um, also to think about what other aspects are, um, you know, for our patients. Is there ways 
that we can decrease the risk of needing um, a blood transfusion, particularly the Society for Thoracic um, Surgery and some of the and the anesthesiology societies have looked at maybe we need to prepare our patients better for going into surgery so we don't need to transfuse them. We all know that um, really, um, you know, pre-op anemia, well, we don't all know, but we're trying to preach that, um, is that the pre-op anemia is really the number one risk factor for somebody who needs a transfusion, either during surgery or post-op. So let's um, start to go through the trials. Um, this was a, um, um, in, in 1999, um, Herbert and his group um, published this multi-center trial that was uh, based out of um, critical care centers um, across Canada. They had over 800 ICU patients. Um, they were uh, enrolled in the trial. They had a hemoglobin less than nine in the first 72 hours of being in the ICU. They were uh, randomized to two arms. One arm was the restrictive strategy where they tried to maintain the hemoglobin uh, between seven and nine and they would transfuse, and they would transfuse one unit at a time if the hemoglobin dropped below seven. The liberal arm was the, the classic um, transfusion trigger of 10, and they tried to maintain the hemoglobin between um, 10 and 12. Um, their primary outcome measure was death from all causes in 30 days after that randomization. They did exclude some patients. They excluded actively bleeding patients, and they also excluded patients with acute MI or acute ischemia or acute coronary syndrome, and that was due to ethical reasons. Um, they found, um, and from the results and from the patient demographics, the patients um, had really similar features. And here's where their results. Um, their 30-day mortality was really no different between the two arms. And so um, there was a, so the, the authors really concluded that there was no de demonstrable benefit to a liberal transfusion strategy in the critical, um, critically ill patient population. Interestingly in this study, um, if you've read the, the study, um, read the article, is that there was um, a benefit to patients with a lower Apache score. Um, but um, what really we look at is you know, the, the, uh, all, all the patients within that trial. Um, interestingly, um, of course, there was less amount of transfusions to the restrictive group versus the liberal, liberal group. Um, length of stay was similar um, between both arms as well. Um, what about patients with stable cardiac disease? Um, well, I, and I will talk a little bit more about this in the FOCUS trial, but um, re soon after um, Herbert published their original um, work, they went back and they looked at a subset of the patients within the TRIC trial, and um, they had um, 375 patients who had known cardiac disease, and they compared the two cohorts, and they found no overall difference in mortality um, in the restrictive group versus the liberal group for the patients who had coronary disease. Um, okay, so what about our pediatric patients in um, ICU? Do they have, is there any difference in them if we do a restrictive versus the liberal transfusion? Well, um, this was a study by LaCroix, and this again was in um, Canada. They looked at a multi-center randomized control trial um, in patients in the PICU. They compared a 7 gram threshold to 9.5 gram threshold. Um, they did not use mortality as their primary outcome. They used MOD score, which um, uh, multi-organ uh, uh, multi um, dysfunction really score, and they found that there was no difference between the two arms. And um, again, a fewer transfusions were within the restrictive group. Um, and um, really, uh, over half of the patients in the restrictive group received no transfusion versus only 2% in the um, liberal group. Okay. So let's go back now to adults. We have um, the FOCUS trial, which was published a couple years ago. This was by um, Carson and his group. Again, this was a multi-center randomized control trial. And what he wanted to look at was uh, patients, particularly patients with cardiac disease, and he chose to have um, look at um, patients who had hip fractures because he knew these patients would need transfusions. And so they enrolled over 2,000 patients who were 50 years and older and had, um, who had or had history of or risk factors for coronary artery disease. Um, they, their randomization, uh, their triggers were, um, of course, the liberal was the 10 grams um, um, of hemoglobin, 
And their restrictive arm was a little different than what um, her bear had in that they looked at for symptoms of anemia and that uh, whether the patient had chest pain, had congestive heart failure, uh, unexplained tachycardia or hypotension that was unresponsive to fluid resuscitation or fluid replacement. Or if the hemoglobin did drop down to um, eight or below, then it was the, the discretion of the physician. They again trans one unit at a time to these patients and they re reassess, reassess after each unit. Their primary outcome was death or really in the joint replacements um, surgeries, they wanted to look at their ability to walk um, 10 feet without human assist um, at a 60 day follow up. And here's where their results were comparing the two, um, the two groups. Um, again, with the restrictive, you had um, less than 50% of the patients required transfusion. Um, their mean pre-transfusion hemoglobin was eight versus a 9.2 in the liberal group. Um, median units transfused were about two in the liberal group versus none in the restrictive. And again, um, on these outcomes, which was death or that inability to walk at that 60-day period, were, were similar. Um, they also looked at some secondary outcomes was um, more cardiac complications, um, was that, such as MI and unstable um, angina. And there was, again, no difference between the two groups. So the authors concluded that a liberal transfusion strategy was not superior to a restrictive strategy. Now, let's switch a little bit to um, cardiac surgery patients in the um, post-op um, trial, in the post-op period. This is from um, HR, and it was published in 2010, and this is a single center, it's a prospective non-inferiority um, randomized control trial. Uh, they looked at um, transfusion requirements in over um, 500 patients, just a little over 500 patients, uh, these patients underwent elective cardiac surgery, both cabbage only and also valve surgery. They um, used a hematocrit trigger, which we can equivalent to um, hemoglobin. So a liberal was a hematocrit of either 30% or about 10 grams, or, and restrictive was a um, hematocrit of 24% or 8 grams per deciliter. Um, they excluded emergent surgeries, um, patients who had a, a pre op hemoglobin less than 10, um, or patients who had um, known coagulopathy, and um, they also excluded patients with end-stage renal disease. Their primary outcome was the 30-day all-cause mortality and um, severe morbidity, um, such as any um, cardiac, cardiogenic shock or um, um, acute respiratory distress syndrome or any acute renal injury. Um, they did note that when um, looking at the two patients, the liberal group was slightly older. Um, there was no difference, though, between the groups in their comorbid conditions, their heart failure score, their uh, pre-op labs, or were their um, rate for going back to the back to OR. Um, here again, we had their 30-day mortality and cardiac complications were no different between the two groups. And so the authors concluded that a restrictive um, transfusion was as safe as a liberal transfusion. Now, at, um, early of last year, in 2013, Villanoa um, out of uh, South America published this. It was a single center randomized control trial that they looked at um, um, the different transfusion strategies in patients with upper GI bleeding. And so their group was just, just a little under 900 patients who uh, presented with hematemesis or melanoma or both. Um, they um, excluded patients who were massively bleeding or already had received transfusions, any patients with uh, coronary syndrome or had stroke or um, um, a TIA. Um, they also excluded patients with recent history of trauma or surgery. Um, they excluded, they really excluded patients with um, lower GI bleeding. They wanted to look at upper GI bleeding, and also they wanted to exclude patients who would have a low risk of having a transfusion. Um, their triggers were a restricted of seven grams and then a liberal of nine grams per deciliter. Again, this um, study transfused one unit at a time to their patients, and then they reassessed afterwards. Um, their primary outcome was rate of death within the 45 days, 
Secondary outcomes were rate of further bleeding and in-hospital complications. Looking at the two groups, there was no um, difference in based on characteristics. And here's their results, which was a little different than, than the other studies in that um, there was a little bit in, um, that, the, that the restrictive transfusion strategy was definitely no worse and in fact had improved, out, had improved outcomes. Their 40-day mortality was um, better in the restrictive group, further bleeding was lower in the restrictive group, and cardiac complications was also lower. So these studies kind of show to us that um, not transfusing is really as safe as transfusing. So the question is, is there evidence to show us or suggest that transfusion may be even less safe? Well, let's walk through a few of some mainly really observational studies. This is information or this is data that was from the TRIP trial that came out. This is, um, in looking at the complications um, in the patients in both the restrictive and liberal um, groups, the percent of patients who had MI and or respiratory complications was higher in the liberal group versus the restrictive group. In, um, this was a subgroup um, uh, analysis out of the uh, CRIT trial, uh, which was really looking at anemia transfusions um, and um, complications in ICU patients. And this um, study was done a while back, but this was, um, Shore did a subgroup analysis and wanted to know if there's any in independent predictors um, in the ICU patients for new acquired bloodstream infections. And interestingly, there was um, any RBC transfusions came out to be a um, predictive indicator and really the highest of the other two. And what also was interesting is that there was, um, as, as the number of units were transfused, this odds ratio increased. And we'll see that again in some other um, observational studies. And so really the transfusion, the, the new um, infection, the new bloodstream infections um, really was a dose-dependent risk um, in, in these ICU patients. Merrick and um, Corin did a meta-analysis of some observational studies. They did 45 studies and really just under 300,000 patients. They did a multivariate analysis to uh, correct for age and illness of severity between um, the groups of patients. And what they wanted to look at was out, uh, the, measure, the outcome measures of mortality, again, infection, multi-organ dysfunction, and um, ours were respiratory complications. And here's what they found. They found that, um, that there was definitely an association between blood transfusion and risk of death. There's an association between um, blood transfusion and risk of infectious complications. And they also found that there was association between blood transfusion and risk of ARDS. And their conclusion was that the current transfusion practices really probably requires some reevaluation. This is um, now looking, now switching gears a little bit to our cardiac surgery patients. This is um, um, Colleen Pack out of um, Cleveland Clinic. And they, went and they wanted to look at the morbidity and mortality risk associated with um, um, transfusions. Um, this was just under 12,000 patients who had undergone um, either primary or, or revision of, of um, cabbage-only surgeries. Um, and they found that each unit of red cells increased the risk for um, death, the renal complications, whether the patient was on the vent more than three days, um, um, serious infection, cardiac morbidity and any neurologic morbidity such as a stroke and or um, CNS complications. Within the tax trial, which I talked to you um, about, it was regardless of the treatment strategy, um, the number of transfusions appeared to be an independent risk factor for worst outcome, and they showed that each unit um, transfused increased the risk of complications for um, respiratory, cardiac, renal, and infection. And then now really just hot off the press, just uh, within the last month, in fact, I think it was early last month, 
um, Rao and Sherwood and Rao did, um, they did a retrospective cohort study. They, uh, this was uh, patients within the CAF PCI registry from 2009 to 2013. Um, and they looked at all uh, comers except for patients who had, of course, missing data and then patients who had gone to cabbage within that same hospital stay. Um, they wanted to look at the overall transfusion rates, kind of get a feel of that. And they also wanted to look at that association of transfusions with any um, cardiac complications such as MI, any stroke, or death. Um, and so they found that, again, there was a, a definite risk for in-hospital um, MI, stroke, or death associated with transfusion regardless if the patient was bleeding or not. Interesting, too, they found that although the rate of transfusion was low, um, you know, about 2.4 percent, it really had a wide range, and it was independent. It was uh, dependent on both uh, on the facility and on the um, individual physician. So, kind of in summary of what uh, presented here, we have uh, um, clinical trials in ICU patients, cardiac surgery, and patients with upper GI bleeding and hip fractures. And, and with even patients with chronic cardiac disease, that suggests that a restricted transfusion strategy is safe. Um, observational data uh, further shows that transfusion is associated with some worst outcomes, and also that these worst outcomes appear to be dose dependent. So the more blood we give, the worse the outcome is. And so we have from um, the recommended guidelines, which was published by um, Carson and all for, uh, for AEDB, is that for hospitalized stable patients in the ICU, um, the transfusion threshold should be um, less, or seven or less, um, with kind of a goal to maintain that hemoglobin between seven and eight. In the post-op period, usually the threshold is eight, or if they're symptomatic. Um, hospitalized patients with pre-existing cardiac disease, of course, if you want to look at symptoms or their uh, threshold of eight or less. And then hospitalized stable patients with unstable angina, acute MI, um, it's kind of unclear at this point. Um, and though the recommendation is to keep their hemoglobin um, between nine and 10. Two other points that came out in those recommendations, which are also in some of the other recommendations from the critical care groups and from the um, um, cardiac surgery group is really to make transfusions decisions based on um, a combination of things, not just the laboratory value, and to look at the patient and to determine, um, to evaluate both signs and symptoms of the patient and to use that hemoglobin value. And also what we're trying to um, preach and advocate to our residents um, in, at the medical college is to use single, single unit transfusions in the non-bleeding patients and to reassess those patients after, afterwards. Um, and so I'll close with that and take any questions.